nosotros creemos aquí los jóvenes que una revolución es posible en los Estados Unidos, por eso mi mensaje es a todos los jóvenes estadounidenses que sigan movilizándose, que sigan luchando, que nosotros creíamos en, en, la, en años anteriores que una revolución iba a ser posible en Venezuela y fue posible gracias a la constancia del pueblo y gracias a la llegada de un líder, sin embargo, si, si tenemos la posibilidad de movilizarnos y luchar por lo que queremos, en Estados Unidos se puede lograr una revolución. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders in Caracas, Venezuela, where one of the big questions is, who owns what? It's a very old question asked all around the world. Coming up, my interview with historian Peter Leinbaugh about an 800-year-old document called the Magna Carta that deals with exactly that. Well, we don't often look back 800 years on this program, but today we will, and here's why. 800 years ago, following a revolt by the English nobility, King John put his seal on the Magna Carta, or Great Charter, a peace treaty of sorts, the traces of which can be found in our law today. The charter guaranteed that the king would respect feudal rights and privileges, uphold the freedom of the church, and maintain the nation's laws. It became the basis of what we call habeas corpus, the right not to be detained arbitrarily. But the Magna Carta established more than that. It also established the rights of the commons, the right of landless, common people, to use public, even sometimes privately held land for shared benefit. Our next guest is the historian on this topic. What happened to the commons part of the Magna Carta? What happened to our commons? And if we were to update the Great Charter, whose power would people want to rein in today? Peter Leinbaugh is Professor Emeritus at the University of Toledo and the author of many books, including the Magna Carta Manifesto and most recently, Stop Thief, the Commons Enclosures and Resistance. Peter, welcome to the program. Glad to have you. Thanks. Glad to be here. So take us back, 12, 15. Um, what was life like back then? And does it matter? Well, well, it does matter now. I mean, because uh, fossil fuels at that time was not oil, nor was it coal. It was the woods. Mm -hmm. It was the forest. It was, we could call it the rainforest if you wanted. But that time it was the woodlands or the forest. And uh, England had recently been invaded, it felt, by the Normans coming over from uh, France. Uh, they themselves were Scandinavian, they spoke another language, and they also brought with them different creatures such as deer and um, I think some, some types of rabbit, but I'm not quite sure. Anyway, they wanted to claim all the forest lands, and they wanted to claim also to run their deer, basically for for great feasting and for hunting and to show their uh, prowess uh, as hunters. So that's one important theme. But the other big theme, I think, besides the f different fossil fuel regime, is the formation of the state, of a centralized monarchy. And who is going to rule this? Is it going to be a secular authority like uh, the kings, mm -hmm. derived from, the, of course, the Normans, or is it going to be uh, not a temporal authority, but an ecclesiastical or church authority? So this is a conflict at the very time that the Mediterranean is opening up as a realm of commodity trade. Mm. So we won't say globalization, but we could say something like that. I'm hearing a bunch of parallels. Yes. Okay. So th this is the conflict going on throughout Europe. And it has to do with the commodity. It has to do with producing things for a market, producing things for, for trade, and of course for profit. Now, just to distinguish commodity markets, commodity economy from what preceded it, what, what was the difference? Subsistence, production for use, production for your neighbors, production for your village, 
At that time, it was local. They went local. No jet travel, of course, no high-speed trains, uh, and even to go on horseback was really the sign of the nobility, of the aristocracy. The rest right. of us went on foot. So pick up the story with the commodities. Yes, yeah, well, it has to do with the cities. The cities grow. You have the first bourgeoisie, we say, you know, around the bourse, around the marketplace. And they are struggling with these people on the horses, the nobility. Here is your, here is your class conflict, we could say. All right, and this is a traditional and well-known story. And part of the Magna Carta is protecting the, what they call the freedoms of the city, mm -hmm. or the corporation, as they would say, which is a place of traders. It's also, this is very essential for us too, it was also a time when Jews were a transnational. Remember, there's not, there are no nations or states yet. They're being formed. Jews has played a special role in this. We mentioned 1215, the date of the Magna Carta. 1215 is also the date of the Lateran Council when Jews have to wear a special sign, okay, because they're associated with the commodity trade. Perhaps I'm throwing too many things into the pot at once. Let's get back to Magna Carta and to a little place on the River Thames, Runnymede, in, uh, what shall we say, June 15th, 1215. Because a lot of people say this was the first time the power of the people reigned in the power, well, of the powerful, the power of the even more powerful, in this case, the king. Okay, now Is that you fair? I personally think it's fair, and I will fight for that, footnote by footnote. I probably got it from you. No, no, you get that. That is the old story. That's the Whig story. Then along comes not the neocons, but the conservatives who say, oh no, this was a deal that you don't really understand. Freedom at that time meant pr privileges for the nobility or the bourgeoisie. But they see, they were fighting a war, and their horses consumed a huge amount for dinner. And the people who produced that dinner was the peasantry. And the people who did the fighting were the peasantry. Yeah. So the people did play a role. But both your nobility and your bourgeoisie in the history of Magna Carta want you to forget that. Yeah. They also want you to forget the other part of the treaty that had to do with forests. Can you talk about that? One of my faults as a historian is I love dates. And the date we have for the Magna Carta is the 15th of June, 1215, which the British people would rather have polls show as a national holiday rather than the Queen's birthday. But here in New York, everyone remembers the 11th of September. Now, the 11th of September is when the Charter of the Forest was recovered in 1217. So two years later. So there's two charters. This is why we say the Big Charter, or Magna Carta, which actually is only... Only like that. Yeah, big. It, all right. And then the Charter of the Forest, which is smaller. Throughout the centuries, they are called the Charters of British Liberty. Uh -huh. There's two of them. But when they came over to America, the, co the, the English colonists only brought one of them. Why? Because they wanted the woods in America. They, they, and the people who had the woods in America were people who already lived in America. Indigenous people. Exactly, indigenous people who were wondering, why are these white people coming from England? And they said amongst themselves, it must be they ran out of wood. Which, to be fair, they seemed as if they did. They did indeed. They did indeed. All this, those boats going to and fro. Exactly. exactly. So, but the forest charter was threatening because of what it guaranteed. And we talked a little bit about what people were doing before they got into commodities trading. But as I understand it from your work, what it guaranteed was the right to gather nuts, fruits and berries, uh, graze your animals, even plant some things on what was called common land, which sometimes was owned by someone, but was shared in common, used in common, used to benefit everybody. That was what was in that charter, right? Yes, that's right. Particular uses, even in the Magna Carta, you look at Magna Carta 69 or 67 chapters. The seventh chapter gives the widow's estovers in the forest. Estovers being? Estovers being wood taken for the purpose of building or the purpose of replacing a rake handle for tools, for for thatching, for constructing your house, and most important, for fuel. So for personal consumption, things you might need, subsistence, survival, Energy. you couldn't necessarily make a factory, but you 
could use the logs you'd find in the forest for your own preservation and protection. And every location, there is no law, but there's customary practices right. known in oral rather than written authority. And the keepers of the oral authority are the elders. So your books that talk about the, the claiming of the commons, the dispossession of the commoners, the most recent collection has as its title, Stop Thief. Yes. That has to do with the resistance to all of this. It Talk does. about what that struggle was about, what it meant no longer to be able to go and have your right of the forest and your estovers. In Chiapas, Mexico, when they crank up the chainsaw, they're tearing down the forest and they're tearing down the subsistence for the people who live there. Today. Today, who must go then look for a J-O-B. This is the origin of the J-O-B. This is the origin of what we used to say, the proletariat. Right. Where you could not live, you could not have dinner on the table or make your rent unless you were willing to have a job and you could not have a job unless that job produced profit for your employer. The regime of the commons makes it possible to live without that oppression or exploitation. Therefore, you don't attack the people directly, but indirectly, with that boom chainsaw. But chains and whips and incarceration, prisons and cops, the process of getting people off the commons wasn't pretty. A fellow said it was written in letters of blood and fire. Yeah. And in the case of England, it took centuries I was to get say, people off the land. How long did it take? In the case of Scotland, somewhat less, perhaps two centuries. In the case of uh, the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, a generation or two. And who resisted and how? It has to do with a total realm, a total basis of what kind of human beings we want to be. And so there are many who will resist who haven't directly been expropriated but can see that it's coming. There were organized expressions of it. Yes. The, the levelers, the... The diggers. The diggers. The, the ranters. Diggers planted things in the, protest. Yeah. I can tell you what. Peas, turnips, carrots. What would they do? Root crops. The diggers. They would go and dig up the hedges that were making private property. The levelers would go and level the fences that were making private property. Now, hold it. I don't hang on to your checkbooks, everybody. I'm not threatening your own property. It's property that is used as capital, as we say. It's used as a, quote, resource for exploitation of others. Would you want to go back, though, mm -hmm. to that pre-enclosure era? I mean, as you said, people say the land became more productive after mm -hmm. that. We fed more people. Life was perhaps less grueling. We didn't work all the time with the harvests. Uh, Perhaps it's a better life for women, for gays and lesbians. Help me out here. Do you I want to go back out. to a golden age? Was it a golden age? It's, a golden age is an aristocratic figment from Roman times. I'm talking about something real. I'm talking about, you mentioned women. Women are at the center of the commons. W women, because even today, especially today, it's the women of the planet who nurture and bring about the reproduction of human society. So today, expropriation means attack on women. This is why such scholars as Andrea Smith or others or Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz will stress the violence against women as a process of conquest. Because the first step in conquest is to destroy the culture, the, where culture means the possibility of reproduction of human society. And this is why regimes of the commons, and here I mentioned Jeanette Neeson, the tremendous professor uh, at the University of Toronto, former uh, colleague of mine at the University of Warwick. She wrote The Commoners, and she, she showed how you, you could talk and gossip and gab, you know, whilst, whilst gardening, whilst working in the forest, with, with the cow, with the panage for the, for the pig. You know, so it's, uh, we're talking of, uh, community mm. 
that is through the commons. We're not talking about division between human life and resources. Rather, we're talking about a, a mixture. Do I personally want to go back? Of course. I would love to go back. I think human happiness ended at a certain point with the birth of capitalism. I really do. I really do. I'm not talking about living forever. I think that's a blasphemous goal. I'm talking about what do we want in life? What do we want as human beings? If you were going to be crafting a Magna Carta today, mm. or, or even a little Carta, mm. or maybe two charters, mm. um, who would you be reigning in? What would you put in those documents? It's probably not the king or queen anymore. No, we have to refer to the 1% uh, who must learn to common or to share, or if they don't, they must be commoned. That is, they must, if they're not willing to be active in the solution to the problems they represent, then, then they must be taught that by severer measures. <clears throat> yes, so the, uh, when I say the 1%, I'm, what I basically mean is the rule of uh, money, socially. I also particularly mean the ruling classes of every continent. This is closely associated with patriarchal forms of, of property bequeathment, of, of violence, of adults against children, men against women. So these are structures which the 1% through the ages have built up and are not going to be rooted out easily, but it's our task and our duty, I think, in thinking of the Magna Carta and the Charter of the Forest, these two charters of liberty, to begin again. Where does the slogan, Stop Thief, come from? The Wobblies. The Wobblies. Stop thief, you shout, and everybody says, okay, I'll stop the thief. And that way you get their attention. You get people's attention, and then you can start, enter into your spiel about the 1% and the 99%, which actually people know. What we need to know now is how to get out of this. Yeah. There's so much good stuff in your books, Peter, and a lot of it should be common in the curriculum. Uh, but one thing in particular sticks with me, and that's your poem about the goose. Well, mm. not your poem, but can you tell it to us? You know, not only will I tell it to you, I will tell you a story about it. Even better. The law locks up the man or woman who steals the goose from off the common, but lets the greater villain loose who steals the common from the goose. The importance of this is so that we see who the villain is and that we understand that the prison and the commons go together. Yeah. That's the importance of it. Peter Linebaugh, we could talk to you forever. <laughs> I love it. Stop Thief, the commons, enclosures, and resistance. We'll put a link to this book and all of Peter's other books at our website. Thanks for coming in. You're welcome, Laura. Thank you. Somos un movimiento social que se llama Otro Beta, este, de los chamos del barrio, pues, integración popular, motorizado, grafitero, rapero, este, todo lo que pueda existir en un barrio, pues. Y bueno, este, mi saludo especial, pues, a toda esa gente luchadora allá de los movimientos de Estados Unidos, pues, que luchan por... por por la integración, por la, por la independencia. Más que todo, darle un buen mensaje a toda esa gente que piensa mal de, de, de lo que son los barrios en Venezuela. Nosotros esta somos este, una organización de jóvenes, somos un colectivo de colectivos eh, que trabajamos con, la, con, la, con, con, con los códigos de nuestros barrios, de nuestra gente, desde las bases, desde lo que les gusta a las personas, desde lo que hace desde el más mínimo trabajo hasta, hasta el trabajo más importante que haya en, en nuestra zona. Todos son bienvenidos y todos trabajamos en pro de mostrar lo que realmente somos, un pueblo organizado que trabaja por su pueblo y que está pendiente de revolucionar, de, 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 
de activar al pueblo, de, de seguir nuestras propias tendencias, de no dejar que, 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 que otros induzcan la manera en la cual tenemos que vivir nosotros. Y de eso se trata, organizar a las masas para obtener el resultado y para adelante. Nos enfocamos más en lo que es el, la, eh, el barrio, pues que es de donde venimos, independientemente, eh, sin exclusión. Somos un movimiento que está a nivel de, de todo Miranda, incluso hemos visitado otros estados. Y bueno, seguimos en la lucha, pues que es, constan es, constan es constante y así es lo que vivimos el día a día. pues También a pesar, a través de las varias realidades que tenemos, nosotros también tenemos deporte, tenemos música, tenemos muralismo, graffiti. Nosotros estamos también trabajando por cambiar las condiciones de nuestras comunidades, por organizarnos, por politizar a los jóvenes. Y bueno, que, que sepan que al final nosotros somos el pueblo, que nosotros eh, somos en la clase, somos los pobres, vengan de donde vengan, vengan de Venezuela, vengan de Estados Unidos, somos la misma gente. Yo lo que hago es más que todo muralear, incentivar a los chamos, traerlo hacia la lucha del barrio, activarlos para que, para que entren en el movimiento de la revolución, pues que somos la misma clase, pase lo que pase, todos estamos en la misma lucha y bueno, que ap apoyar la, el movimiento, pues, el movimiento cultural del, de, del país, de todo el mundo. Nosotros mayormente con la fundación lo que queremos hacer es conservar el legado de Chávez en base a todo, todas esas líricas, todas esas frases y pensamientos que nos dejó, que nos decía que teníamos que ser, ejercer el poder popular. Nosotros creemos aquí los jóvenes que una revolución es posible en los Estados Unidos, por eso mi mensaje es a todos los jóvenes estadounidenses que sigan movilizándose, que sigan luchando, que nosotros creíamos en en, la, en años anteriores que una revolución iba a ser posible en Venezuela y fue posible gracias a la constancia del pueblo y gracias a la llegada de un líder. Sin embargo, si, si tenemos la posibilidad de movilizarnos y luchar por lo que queremos, en Estados Unidos se puede lograr una revolución. The emails keep on coming, my inbox is more than full, the needs proliferate as do the ingenious ways of giving. And Congress just renewed dozens of tax incentives for people giving to charities. So how come I get a sinking feeling every time I see a subject line with the words kickstart or crowd rise, go go or go fund me? Right now on the crowdfunding site Kickstarter alone, I can fund Ebola research in half a dozen countries, literacy programs for low-income kids in the States, journalists on every continent and the next great tech tool, all at the click of a mouse. As Just One Pitch explains, when nearly one in ten U.S. secondary schools has no music program, 11% don't teach art, and more than half have cut theater, it's great that funding by motivated individuals can save what shrinking government budgets have cut. It's just that every email makes me long for the day when, to paraphrase an old bumper sticker, our schools and hospitals get all the money they need, and the Pentagon has to crowdfund its weapon systems. Let's be clear, the Pentagon is crowdfunded by us through the tax system. For the last 52 years, Congress has never failed to pass the National Defense Authorization Act, or NDAA. It passed for the 53rd time in a bipartisan 89 to 11 vote in December. The 2015 Act provides $521 billion in military spending, nearly $18 billion for nuclear weapons, $64 billion for overseas contingency operations or war. And as usual, the legislation's crafted behind closed doors, so we've only the barest idea what's in it. Giving to charities, meanwhile, is largely tax-free, thanks to Congress, so all those charitable contributions actually deprive the government of revenue. Along with revenues, the pool of taxpayers who can't offshore, offset, or otherwise avoid paying taxes keeps on shrinking. So you and I, we're getting all those emails every day and simultaneously keeping the military contractors in business. In the spirit of fairness, it would only be right to switch things up. If Americans are all so happy with surveillance, let's see how NSA's PRISM program fares on Kickstarter. Tell me what you think. Laura at GritTV.org. And thanks.
today on the program, critic of foundations, Peter Buffett. I'm not calling for an end to capitalism, I'm calling for humanism. At the end of another year, we look back at some of the program's highlights. This is a very racist society. And we get a sneak peek at a documentary in progress about the lives of women and girls of color in plain sight. It was socialistic, you know, the uh, indigenous socialism collectively. This is why uh, native property wasn't recognized because it was collectively owned. They literally put in this, you know, the Dawes Act, the Allotment Act, that, that selfishness had to be created right. for civilization to flourish. So we're talking about, as indigenous peoples, revitalization of a language that was taken away from many of our people. <laughs> 